Our topic tonight is solving the riddle of religious confusion. Have you ever noticed that every church says, we have the truth? Have you ever noticed that most preachers say, we are the right ones, come and follow us? How do you solve the riddle of religious confusion? Tonight our journey begins in the city of Babylon. Our minds are going back over 2,500 years. We're traveling down procession way, entering into the Ishtar Gate. Why are we traveling back to an ancient city of Babylon to learn about the truth of the book of Revelation? In the book of Revelation, there are two philosophies presented. The philosophy of God's truth is found in the city of Jerusalem, the heavenly truth of God's Word, and the city of error, Babylon. Two cities, Jerusalem, spiritually speaking, the city of truth, Babylon, spiritually speaking, the city of error. The book of Revelation is a book of contrast, and in the book of Revelation there are two women, the bride of Christ in Revelation 12 and the harlot woman in Revelation 17. This harlot woman in Revelation 17 has a name, and she's called Mystery Babylon the Great. So let's go back. Let's learn as much as we can about Babylon in the Old Testament. Let's see if we can discover something about this city of Babylon so we can understand Revelation better. Babylon was founded after the Great Flood as the center of the kingdom of Nimrod. You remember the story in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, this world was destroyed by a flood. After it was, rebellious men and women, desiring to defy God, desiring to be safe if the world ever was destroyed by a flood again, built a tower called the Tower of Babel. Scholars believe that this was the ancient site of the Tower of Babel, right at the, right at the city of Babylon. And so the site of Babel, was the ancient site of the origin of the city of Babylon. The city of Babylon was built by Nebuchadnezzar, his father Nabopolassar, and it was a very large city. It was a city that was much larger than Rome. Here in this ancient city of Babylon, which was 54 miles south of Baghdad today, the ancient city, is of course in ruins, but Babylon was about 54 miles south of Baghdad, the capital of Iraq, just to give you a little geographical locator for Babylon. The Babylonians ruled from 605 to 539 BC. Tonight, I don't want to look at the military might of Babylon. We don't want to look at the, the history of Babylon from a political standpoint. What I want to do tonight is say, what did the Babylonians believe? What was the heart of their religious philosophy? And how does that religious philosophy, how has that influenced the Christian church today? If we can discover what the ancient Babylonians believed, if we can discover what their doctrines were, we can then understand what God means when he says doctrines from ancient Babylon would influence the Christian church. So let's look at the religious philosophy of Babylon. At the New Year Festival, the great Lord Marduk, who was one of the chief gods, actually the chief god of Babylon, the sun god, was carried along the sacred way and enshrined in the temple. This is the procession way that used to enter into the temple. The archaeologists have uncovered it. Every New Year, Lord Marduk would be carried along procession way. He would be carried past Nebuchadnezzar's palace and placed in the temple that was dedicated to the god Belmarduk. Babylon had over 200 pagan temples. So when you think of Babylon, you're thinking of pagan temples. You are thinking of statues. You're thinking of images. You're thinking of idols everywhere. You're thinking of the worship of gods and goddesses. When you think of Babylon... Here's a statement made by Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's father, and he said this, at the time Marduk, 
Marduk was the chief god, sun god, commanded me to build the Tower of Babel, which had become weakened by time and fallen into disrepair. He commanded me to ground its base securely on the breast of the underworld, whereas its pinnacles would strain upward toward the sky. In other words, in the idea of Babylon, there were these gods and goddesses, and, and there was this idea of the worship of uh, those gods and goddesses that lived on after the uh, city was built. The ziggurat, temple to Belmarduk, was made of 58 million bricks. It's an amazing temple. Inside was a golden statue of Belmarduk, and that golden statue weighed 800 talents, or 4,000 pounds. Imagine it, a golden statue to the sun god Belmarduk, weighing 4,000 pounds. Belmarduk, of course, was the chief god of the Babylonians. Belmarduk was the god that inspired much of the building throughout Babylon. In gratitude to the Babylonian gods, Nebuchadnezzar built no fewer than 53 temples, 955 sanctuaries, and 384 altars. So Babylon was a city of false gods, false worships, images, a city of temples and sanctuaries. In his book, The Two Babylons, Dr. Alexander Hislop points out, Babylon was the primal source from which all these systems of idolatry flowed. So when you think of idols, you think of images, where did they come from? They came from Babylon. Here is one of the archaeological tablets discovered not long ago. The Babylonian king, whoever it was, whether Nebuchadnezzar, his father Nebuchadnezzar, whether it was Nabonidus or Belshazzar, the Babylonian king sat on his throne. He, when he spoke, his word was as the word of God, and he, he ruled under the auspices of the sun god. So when you think of Babylon, you're thinking of a man-made system of religion. You're thinking of human laws and decrees rather than God's laws. You're thinking of sun worship. You are thinking, when you think of Babylon, of idols and images that are predominant or central in worship. Now, the Bible's last book, Revelation, reveals a universal struggle between good and evil. It reveals a universal struggle between truth and error. God's way and man's way are described in Revelation in the symbolism of Revelation's two women. The first is the woman in white in Revelation 12. The second is the woman in scarlet with the wine cup in her hand that she passes around and gets the world drunk on her false doctrine and she rides on a scarlet colored beast. Let's look at these two women. In the Bible, a pure chaste woman is described as the bride of Christ. Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible says, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved his church. So Jesus is the husband. The church is his bride. When the church is faithful to Christ, she has an intimate relationship with her true husband, Jesus. In fact, in the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, the apostle Paul says to the church, I've espoused you as a true bride to your husband. Christ's bride is described in Revelation. But in Revelation 17, there is another woman representing not the true church, but the apostate system. This woman is a harlot woman. She has left her true lover, Jesus, and she's gone and had illicit relations with the state powers. Because she does not get power from Jesus, because she drifts from Jesus, she turns to the state for that power. Revelation 12, verse 1 and 2. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun. This woman is iridescent with the glory of God. This woman is reflecting the great son of righteousness, Jesus. The moon is under her feet. What does that mean? The moon is under her feet. Here is a depiction of the New Testament church, the bride of Christ. The Jesus said, John chapter 5, verse 39, he said, you study the scriptures and they are they that testify of me. 
he was speaking of the Old Testament scriptures and he said they are they that testify of me the Old Testament scriptures reflect the glory of the Son of Righteousness just like the moon reflects the glory of the literal Son so here is Jesus church emerging it is standing on the on the reflected glory of the Old Testament Jesus just in reflected glory in the Old Testament like the moon reflects the glory of the Sun so here is Jesus church arising she's coming out of that Old Testament period she is gonna reveal the Son of righteousness she has something on her head on her head a garland of 12 stars so here is the New Testament church that has guided by the 12 Apostles and guided by those early church leaders the Bible says being with child she cried in labor and in pain to give birth Christ comes forth as the child here described in Revelation the 12th chapter so here you have a description of Jesus people his church here you have a description of Jesus coming forth to begin the whole movement in the New Testament Jesus is the husband and the church is the what everybody the bride the bride of Christ a pure chaste woman represents his true people his true followers the genuine bride of Jesus the New Testament church in Revelation 12 is pictured as being faithful to Christ she's pictured as the bride of the living Christ there in Revelation but the Bible says in Revelation 17 verse 1 and 2 then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me saying to me come and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters is this the bride of Jesus in Revelation 17 is it this is what the great harlot where the woman in Revelation 12 representing the true church was faithful to her Lord and Savior Jesus Christ the woman in Revelation 17 is depicted as a harlot woman one that goes after other lovers other than her spouse Jesus with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication well the kings of the earth are the state powers this woman does this church does not get its power strength and authority from Jesus but she goes out and has an illicit relationship with the kings of the earth she draws her power not from Jesus but from the state the Bible says the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication what is wine wine affects the conscience the reason and the judgment wine affects the brain and so this woman goes out and she passes out her wine cup so here is a picture of the church departing from Jesus getting power from the state and passing her wine cup of false doctrine to millions so they're deceived two systems in Revelation chapter 12 the faithful bride of Christ chapter 17 the harlot woman who passes around her wine cup of false doctrine and who leaves her true lover Jesus we see her riding on a scarlet colored beast in other words controlling the state powers we see her dressed in purple and scarlet let's look at that description even more even further what does it mean that she sits on many waters Revelation 17 verse 15 describes it let's read it together then he said to me the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are what peoples what else multitudes what else nations what else tongues so peoples multitudes nations and tongues this false church system that unites with the kings of the earth has millions of people deceived the Bible calls them peoples multitudes nations and tongues that follow this false religious system now it says she commits fornication what is fornication fornication is an illicit union what's her illicit union with the kings or the state powers of the earth in the fallen church system church is united with the state in ancient Babylon church and state united in Revelation church and state will unite again and the fallen church system will grow large 
It'll be multitudes, tongues, and peoples. So it'll be a huge religious, political, ecclesiastical system that will dominate as it unites with state powers. The Bible says that the true church system is united with Jesus. The false church system unites with the state. The true church system unites with her true lover, Jesus Christ. The Bible goes on in describing this fallen church system, Revelation 17, verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet-colored beast, which was full of names of blasphemy. Notice, names of blasphemy, false doctrine. She had seven heads, and she had ten horns. The Bible goes on in describing this woman. The harlot woman of Revelation 17 represents a false system of religion, a false system of worship. The beast on which she rides represents the state powers. In the commentary by A.R. Fawcett and David Brown, Bible Commentary, page 593, it says this, State and church are precious gifts of God, but the state being desecrated becomes beast-like, and the church apostatizing becomes the harlot. So here you have a description in Revelation, the 17th chapter, of what is coming in America and the world, a church-state union based on the false doctrines of a system called Babylon that come back into the Christian church. Revelation 17, verse 4, gives us further identifying marks, identifying characteristics of this church-state union power. The woman, the fallen system, fallen religious power, was arrayed in purple and scarlet. What are the colors of this great religious system that ultimately would unite with state powers to dominate the earth? What are they? Purple and what? Scarlet. And adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. So here is a large religious, ecclesiastical, political system that, whose colors are purple and scarlet that is quite wealthy and uses a lot of gold and pearls and stones. The Bible describes her. It says she has in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. The Bible talks about the cup of salvation, but she does not have the cup of salvation. She has the wine cup of false doctrine, and millions are deceived by it. The Bible says she is the woman on the city of seven hills. So the fallen church system of Revelation 17 has colors of purple and scarlet, and she sits on a city with seven hills. So summarizing to put it together, the Bible teaches that just as Babylon was an ancient city representing an ancient religious system, so at end time there would be another religious system and that would have characteristics of ancient Babylon. It would be a system built on the traditions of man, not on the Word of God. It would be a system that would be filled with ancient idolatry, just like Babylon was. It would be a system whose uh, religious leaders would wear purple and scarlet, and it would be a system that would be based on a seven-hilled city. It would pass around its wine cup of false doctrine. Millions would accept it. The golden wine cup in her hand represents that intoxication of false doctrine. You know, one night I was preaching on the wine of Babylon, and I was preaching on the false doctrine. I said, what happens when you're drunk? And uh, alcohol affects the brain. And a drunk man actually had wandered into the meeting, was sitting in the back. And as I got preaching about intoxication on the brain, he stood up. I was young. He shook his fingers. He said, that's enough, young man. Don't talk about me. Well, <laughs> the golden wine cup in her hand represents the intoxication of false doctrine. Just as wine affects the brain, you can't think clearly. So people get intoxicated with the false doctrines of Babylon. They can't think clearly. Let's go to the Bible tonight. Let's look very carefully at what the Babylonians taught and believed. Then let's look at just how that flowed into the Christian church today and hear God's call. 
If you want to understand Revelation, it's important to understand what's on the forehead of this woman in Revelation 17. Revelation 17, verse 5, on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great. If you want to understand Revelation, you've got to understand Mystery Babylon the Great. If you don't understand Mystery the Babylon the Great, you're all confused about Revelation. We're going to look at that tonight. This religious system of colors of purple and scarlet. She is the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. So she is the great mother church who has adopted Babylonian principles, but she has many daughter churches who have accepted from the mother church many of those false doctrinal principles and they teach them as well as mother teaches them. Let's go to the Bible, see what we can learn about Babylon. Let's look at it very carefully and minutely, and let's compare it to what we see taking place in churches today. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, in what times, everybody? Latter times. Some will depart from the faith. What kind of faith are they going to depart from? The faith of Jesus, the faith of the Bible, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. I don't want that, do you? I don't want the doctrines of devils. I don't want seducing spirits. But the Bible says in the latter days, the teachings of Babylon would come right in to the Christian church. False doctrines would come into the church through this false religious system that is called, what's that system called, everybody? Babylon. The Bible describes what would take place there and how this would occur. Let's go back to Genesis. Let's go back to the building of the Tower of Babel. Let's go back and discover what happened and hear God's call today from the false religious confusion of Babylon. In Genesis 11, verse 9, the Bible says, Therefore, speaking of this tower, its name is called Babel, or Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the earth. When you think of Babylon, you're thinking of confusion. When you think of ancient Babylon in the Old Testament, the confusion of languages. When you think of New Testament Babylon, the confusion of religious doctrine based on man and not God's word. In rebellion against God, human beings, not God, built the Tower of Babel. So Babel is a man-made system of religion that's not founded in God's word. What are the four, first four letters of Babel? And they are what? B-A-B-Y, which spells what? Baby. baby. Why do you call a baby a baby? The reason why you call a baby a baby is because a baby babbles, right? Well, at least you learned one thing tonight. You know why I call a baby a baby, right? You call a baby a baby because it babbles. Well, a baby has confused speech. So Babel represents confusion of religion. It represents confusion of doctrine. Proclaiming truth is the work and message and mission of God's church, not babbling confusion. God calls us back to his word. Daniel chapter 4, verse 30. So what's Babylon? It's confusion in religion. What's Babylon? The king spoke saying, is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling? Who built Babylon? By my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty. So Babylon represents the exploits of man. Babylon represents what human beings can do. King Nebuchadnezzar said, is not this great Babylon that I have built? So Babylon in religion is based on the works of man rather than the grace of Christ. Babylon in religion is based on the traditions of men rather than the word of God. Babylon in religion is based on the ideas of men rather than the word of God. We look at Old Testament Babylon and we say, any system of religion that's based on the traditions of man, any system of religion that's based on what man can do, every religion, any system of religion that's based on the works of man is Babylon. God's true faithful bride proclaims his word as supreme, not the ideas, teachings, and traditions of man. It proclaims the grace of Christ supreme, not the works of man. We're getting a profile of Babylon. Babylon is a man-made system of religion. Anytime the ideas of man surplant the word of God, that is Babylon. 
Jesus says, Matthew 16, verse 18, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Nebuchadnezzar said, Is not this great Babylon I have built the works of man? Here, Jesus says, I will build my church. The true church of Jesus Christ is built on the fact that Jesus Christ is Messiah. Jesus says, I will build my church. Does Jesus have a church today? I've had people say to me, you know, I'm really nervous. I don't want to become part of any man-made organization, so I don't want to join a church. But Jesus says, I'll build my church. Does he have a church? Yes, he does. He calls it my church. Did he build it? Yes, he did. And he says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There are two systems in Revelation, Revelation 12 and Revelation 17. Two systems. The bride of Christ built on the word of Jesus, built on the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, built on the grace of God, built on the word of God, the Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 17, the woman in scarlet who drifts from her true lover Jesus and builds a man-made system on the traditions of men. The two systems of religion, one man-made, one God-made. And in the final analysis, every single one of us will make a choice. We'll either be part of that bride of Christ in Revelation 12, that God-made religion, or the woman in scarlet in Revelation 17, that man-made system. God is leading us to choose for him. In the Council of Trent, where there was a conflict over how do you define the base of religion, Andrea Nampton writes in his book on Catholic doctrine, page 157, and he says this, tradition, not scripture, is the rock on which the church of Jesus Christ is built. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight the Bible describes a system called Babylon, a system that would rise up and build its religious philosophy on tradition, a system whose colors would be purple and scarlet built on a seven-year-old city, a system that would inculcate many of the Babylonian principles in the heart of its worship, and a system that would be built on tradition. God is calling us from any religious system that is not built solidly on the Word of God. Jesus says, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is what, everybody? Truth. Thy word is indeed truth. Jesus is calling us back from the doctrines and teachings of Babylon. He is calling us from all human religious systems back to his very word. Jesus is calling us to the truth that's found in the Bible. Now there's another aspect of Babylon. Babylon has a human head. Jesus' church has a divine head. Galatians chapter 1 verse 18. And he, Christ, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. The church of Jesus Christ is the only organization that is so big that its body is on earth, but its head is where? Up in heaven. Babylon looked to a human leader. Babylon looked to a human religious leader as their head. Jesus Christ is the only head of the church. What do you say? Amen. Jesus is the head. So what are we learning about Babylon? Man-made system of religion. What are we learning about Babylon? Based on human tradition. What are we learning about Babylon? It has a man as a leader. What are we learning about Babylon? We're learning that it has inculcated human beings in the place of where God should be. Now, Babylon was the center of image worship. Let's go back and notice that in Babylon, and we would expect that if a modern system were Babylon, that it too would incult images in its worship. Why is it that God forbids the use of image worship? Because that takes away of Jesus Christ as our true intercessor. We can come to Jesus as our high priest. We can come to Jesus as our intercessor. We can kneel before the Christ that was resurrected from the dead and stands before the throne of God, and we can worship him directly. If we come with an image and worship through that image, it limits 
our ability to worship the true God through Jesus Christ. There's one mediator between God and man, and that is who? Jesus. But in the Babylonian system, images were used. The commandment says in Exodus 20, verse 4 and 5, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is heaven above or that's in earth beneath. The Bible then describes the command not to bow down to those images by saying, that's in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. So the Bible is clear that images should never play a part in religious worship because they become reverenced and take the reverence that belongs to God alone. They take the worship that belongs to God alone. In Babylon, images were used. Dr. Edward Goodnow, professor of religion at Harvard University, in his book, Religious Tradition and Myth, page 56 and 57, describes how images came into the Christian church out of Rome. This renowned Harvard University professor says, the church, that is the Roman church, did everything it could to stamp out such pagan rites, but had to capitulate. What's capitulate mean? Co give in or compromise and allow the rites to continue with only the name of the local deity. What's a deity? That's what? God changed to some Christian saint's name. Do you see what this esteemed professor at Harvard University says? He says the church growing out of Rome in those early centuries actually compromised to allow the rites of paganism to continue, but only the local God's name was changed. In other words, you have this local God that the pagans have. You change its name and make it a saint, bring that God into the church, and you just rename the image as it comes in to the church. Will Durant, famous historian, wrote a book called The Age of Faith, page 745 and 746 says, the Christian calendar of saints replaced the Roman fasti or the Roman gods. Ancient divinities dear to the people were allowed to revive under the names of Christian saints. That's Babylon. The Babylonians had their gods and goddesses. The pagan Romans had their gods and goddesses. When the pagans were coming into the Christian church, early Christian leaders, according to these historical references, compromised and simply renamed the deities of paganism into the Christian names of the saints. Here is the continuation of this statement, and it's remarkable. Gradually, the tenderest features of Astarte and Sibyl and Artemis and Diana. These were all female pagan goddesses. And Isis were gathered together in the worship of Mary. So Will Durant points out that exactly what history said would take place and exactly as prophecy predicted it, it occurred. Paganism and Christianity began to unite. Cardinal Newman, famed Roman cardinal, in his book, Development of Christian Doctrine, page 372, makes this statement. And I would like to compliment the cardinal for making this statement. He is so honest. He described exactly what happened. And he said, confiding then in the power of Christianity to resist the infection of evil and to transmute the instruments and appendages of demon worship, to an evangelical use. The rulers of the church, now this is the Catholic Cardinal speaking, from early times were prepared should occasion arise to adopt, imitate, or sanction the existing rites, that's the pagan rites, and customs of the populace. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying, look, when the church reached out to the pagan, the Cardinal says, the church recognized that it would not reach a lot of pagans unless it adopted. So you take the names of the pagan gods and you drop them. You bring the images of the paganism into the church. You rename those images into the names of saints 
and you accept the pagan idea, the immortal soul that these saints live on, and you bring that into the church, and you rename this under the guise of Christianity. Ladies and gentlemen, Babylonian principles flooded into the church. If I asked the average person, what is this an image of? They would say, Peter, St. Peter in St. Peter's Cathedral. But if I asked, why is this on the head of St. Peter? This is the Son God. This image was the image of Jupiter. And the statue's image was copied from one of Jupiter. Even to the extent of the sun god on its head, Jupiter was the chief of all the Roman gods. But the pagans coming into the church would be much more comfortable if they looked at a god, Jupiter. Yes, compromises were made. And pagan practices flooded into the church. And if you look at the toes of Jupiter, they have been kissed off down through the centuries, so they are now smooth. Images brought into the church have replaced the direct worship of Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, the Bible says... Jesus says, come to me directly. There is one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. Two systems, Revelation chapter 12, the bride of Christ. Revelation 17, the fallen church system that sits on seven hills clothed in purple and scarlet with false doctrine. The Bible is plain. Babylon would be the center of false teachings about death. Where the Bible teaches that death is but a sleep, and the Bible teaches that men and women who die in Christ rest until the resurrection, Babylon believed in the idea that the soul was immortal. Because it believed that, it went on to worship gods and goddesses. Let's look at what Babylon believed. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 13 and 14, Ezekiel the prophet comes to the temple there at the temple there in Israel and Ezekiel says he God said to me turn again and you'll see greater abominations that they are doing what are these abominations so he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house now here's something going on in the temple at in Israel what is going on how did the Jews drift away from true biblical values and religion he says to my dismay women were sitting and weeping for Tammuz so these women were in the temple of the Lord, in the Jewish temple. They, worship, they were weeping for Tammuz. Who was Tammuz? Well, Tammuz was the God of the resurrection. In other words, these Jewish women had accepted the Babylonian idea that Tammuz, the God of the resurrection, had died. They believed that's why the crops were wilting under the hot sun and uh, that only as Tammuz came back would the crops be restored again. So they were worshiping the Babylonian God of the resurrection because they believed in the idea of the immortal soul of this God. All of this, the Bible says, the idea of the immortal soul, the idea that those that lived on in some form of saints could bless your life now, all of this coming from the streams of Babylon would sweep into the church again. The Bible says, Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5, let's read it together. For the living know that they will what? Die, but the dead know what? Nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. So the Bible says that when you die, you do not know what? Anything. So there is no immortal soul that leaves the body at death. Therefore, the idea of the worship of the saints is a carryover from Babylon based on the concept of the immortal soul. The Bible says, Psalm 115, verse 17, let's read it together. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any that go down into silence. So if they die and they're sleeping, waiting for the glorious day that Jesus Christ will come, then 
the doctrine of immortality, the immortality of the soul, is not found in the Bible. And if they are sleeping, there's no need to worship those saints that do not exist as immortal souls, but righteous men and women down through the ages rest until the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Where did this doctrine of the immortal soul come from? Here is a sermon by Amos Phelps. Is man by nature immortal? And he describes it accurately. This doctrine of the immortal soul can be traced through the muddy channels of a corrupted Christianity, a perverted Judaism, a pagan philosophy, a superstitious idolatry to the great instigator of mischief in the Garden of Eden. The Protestants borrowed it, that is the doctrine of the soul's immortality, from the Catholics. The Catholics from the Pharisees. He goes on. The Pharisees from the pagans, the pagans from the old serpent who first preached the doctrine amid the lowly bowels of paradise to an audience all too willing to hear and heed the new and fascinating theology, you shall not surely die. Who was the first one to proclaim natural immortality that said you wouldn't die? Who was the first one to do that? Where did he do it? In the garden of what? Eden. And the Bible says, John 8, verse 44, that the devil is a liar from the beginning. Babylon. Doctrines of paganism that would come into the church. A human leader rather than Jesus. Human tradition rather than the Word of God. Images that would come into the church as worshipped in temples. Pagan doctrines would flood into the church. The idea that the soul was immortal that paves the way for the mind to accept spiritualism and paves the way to worship saints in images and give them the homage that belongs to Jesus Christ alone. The devil deceived Eve back there in the Garden of Eden. And in modern churches, he is passing around his wine cup to the great mother church clothed in purple and scarlet that sits on the seven hills. And as she passes around her wine cup, many of her daughter churches, Protestant churches that came out of her, are drinking that wine cup and are being deceived and accepting the pagan doctrine of the immortality of the human soul. The early church clearly identified the doctrine of the soul's natural immortality as coming directly from the evil one, the lie that he told in the Garden of Eden. You see, the doctrine of immortality of the soul was the concept of the Babylonians. They believed that the immortal soul left the body at death. They believed that the immortal soul lived on. It was the concept of those Babylonians. Therefore, the Babylonians established a system of gods and goddesses worshiping the spirits of those who supposedly lived on. And the Bible says, Christ and Christ alone is worthy of all of our worship and all of our homage and all of our praise. Jesus teaches that death is but a sleep. When he talks about his own friend Lazarus, he says, our friend Lazarus sleeps, and I go that I may wake him out of sleep. The, our dead loved ones sleep. They rest. They don't know the sorrow, the heartache, the disappointment of the earth. They rest until Jesus comes again. And Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I will come again. Why would he need to come again if when we die, the soul went to heaven immediately? We rest until Jesus comes. But Babylon has its wine cup and millions have been deceived. Now Babylon was the center of sun worship. Let's go back to ancient Babylon and discover it as the center of sun worship. Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 16, so he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. Now notice Ezekiel the prophet says, I'm in the inner court of the Lord's house. I'm inside the temple of God, there at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar. This is the temple of the Lord. The Jews had drifted away from God. They had accepted Babylonian practices in their religious practice. What were they doing? How strongly did Babylon influence even the Jewish faith in the Old Testament? Here it is. There were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord. Their faces, where were their faces? Toward the what? East. What were they doing? Worshiping the sun toward the east. Here you have in the temple of God, 
such a Babylonian influence that even those worshipers in God's temple there in Israel were worshiping the sun toward the east. God called them back from the created sun to worshiping the creator of the sun. He called them back from sun worship and Ezekiel the prophet spoke to them in powerful terms and he said to them, Ezekiel 20 verse 12, reading it together, Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. God's Sabbath was a sign at a time of sun worship. So Babylonian worship, what would happen in the Christian church? Sun worship would come in. In those early centuries, compromises would be made by early Christian leaders out of Rome. The sun day, the day of the sun, the sun, the object of the pagans' worship, Sunday would come into the Christian church the sign of his creative authority, the sign of his creative power, the sign that he made us and fashioned us. That sign given in the Ten Commandments where God says, remember the Sabbath, that sign would be substitute, cast aside in a compromised measure as paganism and Christianity would shake hands there. Sun worship would creep into the Christian church from the channels of Babylon. Worship of Nature, volume 1, page 529, James G. Frazier says, in ancient Babylonia, the sun was worshipped from immemorial antiquity. So sun worship was part of the Babylonian culture. That would then be part of spiritual Babylon. It would be part of understanding the mystery of Babylon the Great. Let's look again at Sunday and its influence in the Christian church. In the book The Two Babylons, page 105 by Alexander Hislop, Hislop says, to conciliate the pagans. What does that mean? It means to accommodate the pagans to nominal Christianity. Rome, pursuing its usual policy, took measures to get the Christian and pagan festivals, that's the Christian Sunday and pagan Sunday, to, to merge them, to amalgamate them, to make them one day, the day of the sun, to get paganism and Christianity now far sunk in idolatry, in this as in so many other things, Christianity and paganism would do what, everybody? Shake hands. So you see two systems, one based on man, one based on God, one based on the traditions of men, one based on the Word of God, one with images and idols in its services, one worshiping Jesus directly, one with a human head, a human man as a leader, one with Jesus Christ as the leader, one that accepts the immortality of the soul and worships saints through the images, one that believes that death is but a sleep and men and women who love Jesus, the righteous, will sleep into the resurrection when Jesus comes. One that has come through the muddy channels of a corrupt Christianity, a compromising Christianity, and emphasizes worship on sun or the sun day. The other that keeps the sign of Jesus Christ and the true Bible Sabbath. The woman in white in Revelation 12, the woman in scarlet in Revelation 17, represent these two systems in the early days of Christianity. There would be compromises in the Christian church. In the early days of Christianity, tradition would substitute for the Word of God and practices not found in the Bible would come into the church. Dr. Edward Hiscox, an outstanding Baptist scholar, Dr. Hiscox wrote the Baptist manual and he gave a lecture on November 13, 1893 to a large group of Baptist ministers, and he really shook them up. Here's what the author of the Baptist manual said very openly. He said, what a pity that it Sunday comes branded with the mark of paganism and christened with the name of the sun god. Now he's speaking to Baptist ministers and he's telling about the origin of Sunday. Then adopted and sanctioned by the papal apostasy, and bequeathed as a sacred legacy to Protestantism. He said, what a pity that Sunday comes through those channels. 
God is leading us from the wine cup of false doctrine of Babylon back to the pure truth of his word. What do you say tonight? God is leading us back, back to his word, back to his truth. The Bible says, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. In the last days, the Babylon of confusion, Daniel 7, verse 25, Daniel predicts that a power would rise that would try to change the very law of God. That law written with his own finger on tables of stone, never to be eradicated. That law that says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Two systems, Revelation 12, the bride of Christ, faithful to Christ. Revelation 17, the scarlet woman with a wine cup of false doctrine that comes in through ancient Babylonian sources, the Bible predicted, that the Sabbath would be changed as church and state united in those early centuries. Here is an amazing statement. It comes from the Catechism Explained, page 89, from the Roman canon, Caferta. Now, this statement is so honest. I appreciate so much the honesty of the Roman church in acknowledging in its own canon what happened. It says, the Sabbath was what? Saturday, not Sunday. The church altered the observance of Sabbath to the observance of Sunday. Protestants must be rather puzzled by the keeping of Sunday when God distinctly said, keep holy the Sabbath day. So the church says, look, we change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, and we have that authority. Do you believe anybody has the authority to change the Word of God? Do you believe anybody has the authority to change the commandments written with God's own finger? Not at all. But notice what this statement says. Protestants must be puzzled by the keeping of Sunday when, they, when God distinctly said, keeping holy the Sabbath day. And indeed, many Protestants are puzzled because they see clearly what the Bible says. Notice as this Catholic canon goes on, the word Sunday does not come anywhere in the Bible. So without knowing it, they, the Protestants, are obeying the authority of the Catholic Church. So the Roman church says, look, we change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. They openly, honestly acknowledge that. Then they say, you Protestants, when you keep Sunday, since there is no command in the Bible to do it, you really are doing it based on acknowledging the authority of the church. Do you see how religion has become a babble of confusion today? Do you see how religion has accepted the wine cup of Babylon of false doctrine today? God is leading us back, back to his word, back to his truth. Here is a quote from a course in religion for Catholic high schools and academies. Page 89, the Benzinger brothers uh, uh, published the book, 1936, and paragraph one from the renowned Reverend John Lau. He says, if we consult the Bible only, we should still have to keep holy the Sabbath day, that is Saturday, with the Jews instead of Sunday. Now look what he's saying. He's so honest. This is a book, high school course book in Catholic high schools. It says, if you want to go by the Bible only, you ought to be keeping Sabbath, that is, keeping Saturday. Then he says, as he goes on, the church changed the day. Now here's what the issues are. The characteristics of spiritual Babylon are plain. Spiritual Babylon is a man-made system based on compromise and based on tradition. Spiritual Babylon is a man-made system centered in idolatry and centered in sun worship. Spiritual Babylon is a man-made system of gods and goddesses focused on the immortality of the soul. So when we say in Revelation, God's word says that the woman would ride upon the scarlet-colored beast, she would have written on her forehead, Mystery Babylon the Great. What does that mean? It means a system that is man-made, a system that is compromised Bible truth, 
A system that has introduced traditions of men rather than the Word of God. A system centered in idolatry that has images. A system that had to have sun worship. A man-made system that would have the immortality of the soul as part of its central doctrine. In contrast to that, there would be the characteristics of Christ's church in Revelation 12. What would that be? A divinely inspired church based on the Word of God. That's what I want this evening. What about you? A system based on what? God's Word. Secondly, Revelation 12 would be a divinely established church centered in Jesus. That's what I want, don't you? A faith that is centered in Jesus Christ, not worshiping through images, worshiping their Creator on His special day, the Sabbath, not the day of the sun. And it would be a divinely established church focused on the coming of Christ and the resurrection of the dead. So we should look for an Adventist, Sabbath-keeping people that love Jesus, that recognize that war and sickness and suffering will be over soon, that worship Jesus in harmony with his commandment that said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, that worship Jesus Christ as our great high priest, that accept the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, that believe salvation is genuinely, totally, authentically through faith and not man-made. We should look for a faith solidly based in God's Word. In the Catholic Mirror, December 23rd, 1893, Cardinal Gibbons made this statement. And I agree with the Cardinal. He's right on target. He says, Reason and sense demand the acceptance of one or the other of these alternatives, either Protestantism and the keeping holy of Saturday, or Catholicity and the keeping holy of Sunday, compromise is impossible. Do you see what the Cardinal says? He says, if you accept the authority of the church above the authority of the Bible, then you go to the Roman church. If you accept the authority of the Bible above the authority of the church, you then accept Sabbath and accept Jesus as your only source of final authority and the Bible as your source of authority. Jesus is leading us to this decision. Compromise is impossible. Revelation chapter 18, verse 2, there is a mighty cry in the last days. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. God says, religious systems of confusion, the great mother church with all of her daughter churches is fallen. Jesus says... Any church based on a man-made system, any church with images, any church with the idea of the immortal soul, any church with the idea of sun worship, Sunday worship that's come in. Jesus says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Then he says, I heard a voice from heaven say, come out of her, my people. Where are most of God's people today? In Babylon. Thousands, millions of them. He calls them my people. They're wonderful people of every religious creed, of every religious denomination. I know that many of you tonight, watching via satellite, 3ABN, Hope Channel, watching in homes here in Orlando, maybe you have never understood these truths before. And tonight, when you see that Jesus has a system, a divinely established people rooted in his word, when you see that Jesus has a faith that's solidly rooted in the cross and his grace. When you see that Jesus is calling us from images, from tradition, from all man-made religion, when he's calling us back to worship him as creator, as Sabbath and Lord, there's a stirring in your heart and a moving in your soul, and you say, Lord, I want to be done with man's traditions. I want to fall at Jesus' feet and worship him alone. I want to be done with worshiping through any images. I want to exalt the Christ and Lord that is Savior. I want a faith based on God's word. I want a faith. I want a faith that is based on loving Jesus enough to obey him. And because I'm saved by grace, I want to keep his commandments. And I don't want to accept son worship, but I want... I want to follow him and, and keep his Sabbath. Honest people, good people, Catholic Christians, Baptist Christians, Pentecostal Christians, Methodist Christians, 
evangelical Christians, good people, wonderful people, but drinking the wine of Babylon? But Jesus speaks and he says, Babylon has fallen, come out of her, my people. He's appealing in these last days to thousands of his people to come out. And he says, lest you share in her sins, what is sin? 1 John 3, verse 4, sin is the transgression of the law. So he says, come out of every law-breaking church. Come to my people, lest you receive of her plagues. Jesus is giving his final, last appeal to all humanity to prepare for his soon return and to prepare for his second coming. I remember many years ago, I was just a boy, 17 years old, educated by the priests and the nuns. I remember sitting in meetings like this, and I said, Lord, how could this be? Lord, I may become a priest. I had memorized the Mass in Latin. I may become a priest, but as I sat in meetings like this, I heard the call of God. I sensed the moving of the Holy Spirit, and I knew I knew in my heart that I had to make a decision. That my decision was either the authority of God's word or the authority of the church. My decision was either worshiping Jesus as my only mediator between God and man or worshiping through images. I knew that it either was accepting the immortality of the soul or accepting the truth of the Bible that death is a sleep to the coming of Christ. I knew that it was either accepting what Jesus says in his command about the Bible Sabbath or accepting the day of the sun with no biblical authority that slipped into the Christian church through the muddy channels of Babylon. As I sat in meetings like this, I had one prayer. Lord, open mine eyes that I can see. Glimpses of truth, Lord, from your word illumine me, spirit divine. Open my ears, Lord, so that I can hear your voice. Jesus speaks to you today. Sometimes to follow him, it's a struggle. Sometimes to follow him, it's a conflict. Sometimes it means stepping out, stepping out from our past, stepping out from the chains of tradition that bind us. Sometimes it means stepping out at times from family, friends. But Jesus' arms are wide open. And Jesus says to you tonight, come. Come out of her, my people. Open mine eyes that I can see. Open mine ears that I can hear. Would you like tonight, right where you are, to bow your head as John comes and sings and pray that prayer, Lord, open mine eyes. Lord, convict me on your truth. Lord, deep within my heart, all I want to do is follow you wherever you are tonight. Make this a prayer time between you and Jesus as John sings right now.
Voices. 